So our first reading today speaks about Job, and uh, we haven't time to go into the whole story, uh, but at the beginning of the book of Job, Job loses everything very, very quickly, uh, his property, his family, uh, his house, his livestock, one by one, messengers come in just to say that everything is gone. Um, before this, there was a conversation between God and, and the evil one, the evil one saying that the only reason Job is faithful to you is because you have blessed him with all of these things, all these uh, property and livestock and riches, basically. Uh, if you take them away from him, I guarantee you he will curse you. And God says, okay, let it be so. Let, the, let those things be taken away from him. And uh, this is Job now in the depths of his misery. It says here at the end, remember that my life is but a breath and that my eyes will never see joy again. You know, it's a, it's a fairly, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly heavy reading, right? Because obviously the story isn't finished. So we're like, oh, after that, losing all these things as well, then he gets these sores on his body. So he's just miserable. And I can briefly, I don't want to get into the whole thing because there's another point to the homily coming. Um, but in Jewish understanding, uh, if a person was blessed with wealth, they were blessed by God. And if a person didn't have wealth or didn't have children or got leprosy or some sort of an illness, they were being punished by God. So then his friends come and they're trying to work out with him, well, you've lost everything, so you must have offended God. What did you do? What did you say? You must have done something. Come on, think, think deeper, think back. There must be some hidden, profound sin in your closet somewhere. And he says, I, I just, I don't, I, don't I don't know, I don't think so. I can't think of anything. And so there's, there are conversations forward and back. But anyway, in the end of the book, which I hadn't intended on talking about at all, the end of it, uh, the Lord then says, he has a com Job has a conversation with the Lord, basically. And the Lord, rather than asking, rather than answering the question of the meaning of suffering, he asks Job a lot of questions about creation. So he says to Job, where were you when the oceans and seas were measured? Where were you, if you know so much, when the stars of heaven were created? When the strength was given to the gazelle that it may jump? When the eagle was taught how to soar? When the, 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 um, uh, who taught the sun how to rise in the morning and so on and so forth? It's very poetic and all of that. Point being, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I'm God. So it's, it, it, is, it is and it isn't an answer to the sense of suffering. It is an answer in that if you believe that God is good, that God is love, you'll understand in time. It's difficult for us to understand this side of eternity. Okay. Um, very brief then, in, in, in our gospel, Jesus is, is, is preaching, but he's also healing and casting out devils. So he's the antidote to all this misery that we see in the first reading. Okay, You've got this, this loss and misery and desperation and depression even you know my eyes will never see joy again and then in the, in the gospel it's there's a just juxtaposition with with the healing and the the joy and the freedom granted by christ and it got me thinking about how in the religious life in the religious life uh, people take religious people take three vows they're called the evangelical councils right poverty obedience and chastity or as the franciscan friars the renewal call them no money no honey, and you get a boss. All right, no money, no honey, and you get a boss. Uh, so, and the interesting thing about these three evangelical councils, right, these, these vows that we take, is that these are actually supposed to prefigure heaven. Okay, it's an interesting thing because uh, you think about poverty, obedience, and chastity. <laughs> It just, like, it sounds like three enormous weights have just been lobbed on your shoulders and you're bound to this life of misery and loneliness until you finally die. <laughs> right? Okay? Rather than poverty, obedience, and chastity being seen as the way we live in heaven. Okay? In heaven, no one really cares um, how much stuff you have. I mean, I'm not even sure if we have stuff in heaven. I don't, I don't know if we do. Maybe we do. But if we do, it doesn't really matter. We, we'll, have, we'll have what we need. We'll have what we need to make us happy because ultimately in heaven, God is our all in all. So everything else is just unimportant, right? So I, 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 we don't really know how things work in heaven. I mean, 
are there shops? Do we have houses? I mean, Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you, so eventually we'll be re reunited with our bodies. Presumably, bodies need to sit down and lie down and eat and drink, so I don't know. But anyway, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be absolutely incredible, but it's amazing how little we know about it, considering it's so important, right? But maybe it is trying to explain to a goldfish what it's like to have Christmas dinner. Just, yeah, it's to look like. I mean, how, how are you going to do it? Just how are you going to put it in terms that he'll understand? But look, we'll see it in time. We'll see it in time. So maybe that's just kind of, that's why so much of it is left unrevealed. Because look, you won't understand it now. You'll understand it then. Okay, and it'll be way beyond any form of comprehension that you could have had here. Heaven is going to be amazing. So the evangelical council is poverty, obedience, and chastity. This is what we have in heaven. Heaven. In heaven, there's a form of poverty, a form of poverty, in the sense that we have everything and we have nothing. We have everything that we have got, so we lack nothing. So everything else is just unimportant. I don't care if I've got 10 pairs of shoes, one pair of shoes, if I walk barefoot. It'll be fine. It just doesn't matter, you know? So then to understand poverty, for example. Poverty, <clears throat> doesn't, poverty does not equal misery, okay? Poverty just means the things we have, we're not attached to. So... Like, for example, you could live extreme poverty. You could live up in a hut, and you have your little one timber bowl and your one timber spoon and your one gray habit and a big long beard, especially for the ladies. And, you know, you could just be li living in a, the lap of absolute, right? But you could be just so attached to that bowl. I love this bowl. It's like the best bowl ever, right? And even though you're living in poverty, you're really attached to this thing. And then if there's another person in the community, it's my bowl. My favorite, but I carve that in my bowl, not touching my bowl. Right? <laughs> so even though in many regards they're living in poverty, they're actually not living, they've kind of missed the point of poverty. It means not to be attached to things. On the other hand, you can live in a, <clears throat> we live in a mansion here. Sorry, we do. Like, this place is amazing. We live in an absolute mansion here. Uh, but it's all at the service of God. I own a computer. It's, for those who care, it's, it's got an i7 processor in it. It was actually given to me. Right? It was a gift. And I use that for the glory of God. When it explodes, I'll get another one. It's just, I mean, it, but they're just things like, they're just there for the service of God. And once we use them for the service of God, we're not attached to them, then, then we, we understand and we're living poverty. Okay, so then this, this can go for anyone, like not just people uh, who have taken the vow of poverty, but in general, like just to, to live with that kind of healthy, detached attitude towards things. We use them. Fine, great. I mean, if you, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with having money. You can even be rich. I mean, if you start a business and it goes well, fair play to you. Well done. That's not the problem, though. But if it's my life is to get more money and my little four-year-old wants to show me something that he just learned, he just learned to walk, I haven't time now. I'm investing money. You know what I mean? Now you've missed the point, okay? That's, that's not how it works. So... Poverty is, is, is how we will be in heaven, where God is our everything. So we can have things, just not be attached to them. Just not be attached to them. They, they, they belong to God. They serve God ultimately. Obedience. Obedience uh, is an interesting thing. Because it, it really isn't as bad as people think. Uh, generally speaking, our superiors are quite good. right? Uh, and if they ask us to do anything that's sinful, then it's very simple. We don't have to obey. So... You know, most of what they ask us to do generally is quite sensible. And if they ask us to do anything wrong, sinful, you don't have to obey. You know, if, you, if, if the Pope were to say, so let us all march out now and start killing those who aren't Catholic, well, of course we don't have to do it. Like, you know, it's pretty obvious, you know. So, so obedience, it's, it's a good thing because it allows, it, it kind of, it, it's going to teach me how to temper my own will. Okay, because we all have a will and it can be quite strong. Uh, we generally want things done our way. Obedience teaches me to, to temper that will. So to, to, I have to verify run these things by my superior before I do them. And it may be that he says no. Or maybe that he says not now. I was like, oh, fine, I'm doing it anyway. Well, then you don't have the blessing of obedience. And Father Paul, my founder, would always say, like, if you don't have the blessing of obedience, then the consequences of your disobedience are your fault. You know you did that because you didn't obey. So, like, you can't go pointing the finger, blaming anyone. You asked for permission, you didn't get it. So, it's on your head. On the other hand, if we ask for permission, we get it, and then things are difficult, 
Well, then that's, if things are difficult, then that's the cross that goes along with the mission, okay? So that's not God not blessing you. It's, it's the cross that goes with the mission, which is different to you did something of your own steam for your own glory and you messed it up. There's, there's, there's a difference there. So obedience is a good thing. Obedience, obedience is going to be the, lived in a very similar way. I would say, I would argue, even in a far more daily way <clears throat> in marriage. Right? There definitely is uh, a very, very tangible form of obedience in marriage because it both goes both ways. Not one person can simply say, everything has to be done my way. You've got two people here and regardless of how much they love each other, they're going to have two different minds because they're two different people. So not everything can be done always the way you want. That's life. <laughs> That's going to be marriage. So in certain ways, you're going to have, one is going to have to obey the other. Honey, can you light the fire? I just sat down. <laughs> All right? You know, and up you go, and you do it. Okay, that's, that's obedience. That's a form of obedience. You don't want to do it, but you're submitting your will to the will of the other person. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's called service. It's called love. So, if, I'm, if anything, the kind of obedience that we live is, is probably less than the kind of obedience than, than, than that's lived in marriage. And finally, chastity. Everyone's favorite. So, chastity. Uh, chastity chastity is, a, is a blessing. I remember our <coughs> canon law professor, <coughs> he said something I'll never forget. He said, chastity isn't a no to our sexuality, but an exclusive yes to God. It's not a no, it's not our sexuality is bad, it's evil, and it's dirty, and it's sinful. No, no, that's not it. It's an exclusive yes to God. Lord, I love you more than anybody else. More than any possible wife, any possible family that I could have had. I love you more. And when it's seen through that lens, it's, it's positive. It's freeing. And it's actually heavenly. Because that's how it is in heaven. In heaven, we don't take wives and husbands anymore. In heaven, God is our everything, and we are perfectly united to even our husbands and wives on earth. We're even more united to them in heaven than we were when we were here. We love them with a perfect, saintly, holy love for all eternity. So we're even more in love with them in heaven than we were here. But we don't have, we don't be, don't be more children made up in heaven, right? So the kind of, kind of the yoke, if you will, of, of, of chastity, it's not what people think it is. It's not as bad as what people think it is. It's, it's, it's freeing. It's an exclusive yes to God. So this is the kind of life that, that, that I'm called to live, that, uh, the kind of life that anyone who has taken vows is called to live. And I think we've seen, in a way, the kind of life that we're all, in some way, called to live. Our, <coughs> our celibacy is fairly specific to, to priests and religious, <coughs> but chastity, purity, everyone is called to live that. Everyone is called to live that. And so even when we find ourselves in great difficulty, when we find uh, our lives having gone a direction that we didn't want, didn't expect, when we find that the, the cross has been laid on our shoulders, uh, and it's, it's weighing us down, it's crushing us. And lying in my bed, I wonder, when will it be day? And then risen, I think, how slowly evening comes. And restlessly, I will fret till twilight falls. Remember that my life is but a breath, and my eyes will never see joy when things are hard and heavy. We raise our eyes to heaven. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then I can be at peace. Which doesn't necessarily take the cross away, but I can be at peace. <clears throat> like Job eventually discovered that even though I'm weighed down, we're dealing with a loving father who has a purpose for all things. So that which may seem difficult, like the cross, sickness, poverty, obedience, chastity, all these things that may seem negative, 
and turn into our greatest blessings. So we ask the Lord to open our hearts to the beauty and greatness of his will, often hidden in these things that seem so negative. And may our Blessed Lady fill our hearts with joy, with light, as she guides us to her Son. Amen.